Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. How was your caffeine and sugar? Are you guys ready? Okay. So just to remind folks, um, questions for the presenters will happen after this final presentation. Um, so during the Q&A session, so please write down your questions on the index cards that are provided and pass them to your left for our staff to collect. Um, you'll have a chance to ask all these questions um, for the entire training session of the day uh, during the Q&A session that um, is after this presentation. And for folks watching at home, you can send us your questions using, using the chat box on the right side of the screen. Oh, that's neat. And all viewers here and at home can send their questions via our Facebook page or via Twitter using hashtag CNTraining. Um, reminder, this uh, panel presentation, you can actually use your eye clicker, so have it ready, have it turned on so your answers can be counted during the audience poll segment, and let's not forget to return your eye clickers um, back to us, so we'll have staff on either end of the ex exits um, retrieving the eye clickers at the conclusion of the Q&A session. So, or we will come to your house. Um, that's right. Um, so let me introduce uh, a good friend and colleague, uh, Thomas Shea. Uh, he is the Director of Training and Technical Assistance at the New York Immigration Coalition. Before starting with the coalition in October 2006, Mr. Shea practiced for 10 years with the Catholic Legal Immigration Network Clinic. Uh, Mr. Shea represented naturalization cases and coordinated group naturalization processing workshops for a clinic in Washington, D.C., before transferring to clinic's El Paso, Texas office, where he represented detained asylum seekers before the Executive Office of Immigration Review. Mr. Shea then transferred to clinic's New York City office, where he represented non-detained asylum seekers, and adjustment of status um, applicants before the EOIR, which is the Immigration Court. Mr. Shea has developed training curricula for a clinic and presented on such topics as international adoptions, relief from removal, and victims of human trafficking. Mr. Shea has lengthy experience training on family-based immigration law, citizenship and naturalization, waivers and exceptions to selected crowns of admissibility, public charge and affidavit of support, adjustment of status, relief in removal proceedings, and unlawful presence. Please give a warm round of applause to Mr. Tom Shea. Thank you, Matilda. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Tom Shea, and it's good to be back um, to the CUNY Daily News uh, training. And thank you all for volunteering to answer the phones and give out information during the week of the the CUNY Citizenship Now and Daily News Colin. Um, and I am your last speaker of the afternoon before the Q&A session, so um, I, fortunately we have exercises in, the, in my presentation to help keep you um, involved in the presentation. And I, um, <clears throat> and I don't know if I should just jump right into it then. I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't wanna keep you all longer than you have to be, so I hope I don't bore you. 
is a highly technical topic. I'm going to be talking about acquisition of citizenship and derivation of citizenship, but it's a very important topic. Because apart from trying to prove that your client or the, say, not that you necessarily would be proving it, but if people call in trying to get information about whether or not their child has derived U.S. citizenship, or if the caller, her or himself, has derived U.S. citizenship or acquired it, um, this information would be very helpful in trying to guide the caller. But this is also very technical information. So if you do get a caller who's trying to find out about whether or not they acquired U.S. citizenship or derived U.S. citizenship, it's definitely worthwhile to speak with an immigration attorney um, or a BIA accredited representative who has a lot of experience in this area to make sure that you're providing um, uh, accurate information. Also, I want to give a shout out to the Immigrant Legal Resource Center, which created the charts that are in the CUNY Citizenship Now manual. And I'm going to be referring to the charts, and you'll be referring to the charts during the, um, the exercises. Uh, so to start out with, at certain times, um, someone born outside of the United States to a U.S. citizen parent or parents may acquire U.S. citizenship at the time of birth. And this is through statute, through the Immigration and Nationality Act. Um, and the, the statute provides not also um, that if you are born outside of the United States to a U.S. citizen parent or parents, um, and if that parent had resided in the United States for a certain period of time before you were born in, outside of the United States, that the parent had transmitted citizenship to the child at the time of birth. Um, this also pertains to people who were born outside of the outlying possessions of the United States, as well as people born in certain territories of the, United, of the United States. So, for example, people born in Puerto Rico, Guam, the U.S. Virgin Islands, they are U.S. citizens at the time of birth in those areas. Um, I mentioned outlying possessions. There is a term, you may not encounter this during the call-in, but just to be aware of, there are certain people who are um, nationals but not citizens of the United States, and these are people who are born in the outlying possessions of the United States. And outlying possessions of the United States right now refers to American Samoa and Swains Island. Uh, we don't normally get, I don't see uh, many people in that situation, um, at least in the New York area. Um, now, with acquisition of citizenship, if the child acquired U.S. citizenship, then it occurs automatically by operation of law. Um, you do not apply to acquire U.S. citizenship. You must apply for proof of U.S. citizenship. Um, either you apply, you file the form N-600 to um, get a certificate of citizenship, or you apply for a U.S. passport. Um, and <clears throat> right now the form N-600, and I'll have more, a slide coming up about it, but the form N-600 is about $600, so it's very expensive to get proof of US, a certificate of citizenship anyways. And um, the longer you wait, even though you don't have to uh, apply to acquire U.S. citizenship, the longer you wait to file to get a certificate of citizenship, the more difficult it could be to gather the supporting documentation. So you want to file a certificate of citizenship or apply for a U.S. passport as soon as possible after you've determined that the person has um, acquired U.S. citizenship. So to determine whether a child acquired U.S. citizenship at birth, the statute that was in effect at the time of the child's birth is what controls. So <clears throat> I'm going to be walking you through the charts that are in the manual um, before you do the exercises. But the charts have different rows and different columns, and they lay out the different laws that were in effect during the history of the United States. So depending on when the person was born in the United States, there might be a different law that was in effect at that time. And with the different law, there might have been different requirements that had to be met in order for the parent to transmit their citizenship to the child. So for the first statute, I'm going to start out with some of the easier ones. A person born outside of the United States and its outlying possessions um, to two U.S. citizen parents is a U.S. citizen at the time of birth, as long as one of the parents had residence in the United States or in the outlying possession before the child was born. And again, the outlying possession right now is American Samoa or Swenton's Island. All right, now uh, for 301D, the Immigration Nationality Act, Section 301D. For children born within wedlock, a person born outside the United States and its outlying possessions to one U.S. citizen parent and to one parent who was a U.S. national but not a U.S. citizen, um, the U.S. citizen parent had been physically present in the United States or an outlying possession for one continuous year before the child's birth. 
So that's what the requirement is in order to transmit citizenship from the US citizen to that child born outside of the United States and outside of the outlying possession. And again, you, I don't know if you would encounter too many people who are you know, born to a US citizen and to a, um, a non-citizen national. So I'm getting a little bit more um, complicated. I think this is the most common issue that, or the common um, category that you'd be dealing with or that you'd be concerned about. Children born within wedlock, but born to one US citizen parent and one foreign national parent. And I took the, actually I used the term alien, I took it right out of the statute, but um, the US citizen parent had to been physically present in the United States for a period or periods of five years before the child's birth in at least two years of of that period inside the United States had to be after the child, after the parent turned age 14. So that's the current law. And as I mentioned, you'll see in charts A and B that at different periods in the history of the United States, there were different laws in effect. So they had different physical presence or different residency requirements for the parent to have been, you know, resided or been physically present in the United States before the child was born in order to transmit the citizenship to the child at the time of birth abroad. So for example, in this particular case, the law immediately preceding the current law required that the parent had been, reside, had been physically present outside the United States for at least 10 years, five of which were over the age of 14. So that's different from the current law. It's a little bit more easy under the, the residency or physical presence requirements are a little bit more easy under the current law. All right, now moving on. You can see that there's different laws that were in effect, different laws apply to people who are born within wedlock and children who are born outside of wedlock. So here, for children born outside of wedlock, a person born out of wedlock to a US citizen father and a foreign national mother has to demonstrate, or the father had to, a blood relationship between the father and the child is established. The father was a US citizen at the time of the US citizen child's, at the child's birth. And the father was agreed in writing, unless deceased, to financially support the child until the child turns 18. And while the child is under age 18, the child is legitimated, or the father acknowledges paternity in writing under oath, or the per paternity of the child is established by adjudication of a competent court. For example, the um, family court judge maybe in, in New York. So for the next category, um, a child born out of wedlock um, to a US citizen mother and a foreign national father, the mother had to have been a US citizen at the time of the um, child's birth, and the mother was physically present in the United States for a continuous period of one year at any time before the child's birth. Keep on track. So now these requirements, um, again, whether for residency in the United States, for being born within wedlock and out of wedlock, and um, regarding um, acknowledging paternity and legitimation by the father, and um, a time, again, a physical presence or residency in the United States, they varied over time. And so the requirements that had to be met by the parent at the time of the child's birth depend on what law was in effect at the time of the child's birth. So here are some questions that you would ask callers if you're trying to clarify whether or not um, a person has acquired US citizenship at the time of birth outside of the United States. And remember, um, at least one parent had to be a U.S. citizen in order to convey, transmit citizenship to the child at the time of birth abroad. But you have to look at the law that was in effect at the time of the child's birth. So here are some of the questions, you know, part, where were you born, you know, obviously if you were born outside of the United States. What is your date of birth um, to set in which law was in effect at the time of the birth? Um, were you born within wedlock or out of wedlock? Um, what was the citizenship status of each parent? Because uh, as you just saw, we walked through, um, the requirements are different if it's a child born to two, US, two U.S. citizen parents, child born to one U.S. citizen parent versus um, um, a non-citizen national versus um, a child born to one U.S. citizen parent and one foreign national parent. And, <clears throat> and where the parents had physically resided through um, the time or the date of birth of the child and what were the parents' dates of birth because you have to determine whether or not the parents resided or were physically present in the United States after a certain age, for example, after age 14. So you need to know when they were born. So our first poll question, and you all have clickers. You, we just walked through some of the 
different categories for acquisition of citizenship. Um, and you saw some of the questions that you have to ask the caller to determine whether or not the parent transmitted citizenship to the child at the time of birth. So one of the questions, in order to acquire US citizenship, you must demonstrate that you are a person of good moral character. Is that one of the requirements that you have to demonstrate if to, to prove that you acquired US citizenship at the time of birth abroad? So we'll have, uh, it's a true or false question. So, wait a minute. Should I say that? That's good. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Scandalous indeed. So the, tr the correct answer um, is false. You do not have to prove good moral character in order to demonstrate that a, someone acquired U.S. citizenship at the time of birth abroad. Um, it's, it's all, it all comes down to, under the current law, it comes down to um, the parent being a U.S. citizen at the time of the child's birth abroad, at least one of the parents, um, that the parent had met certain physical presence requirements in the United States before the child was born outside of the United States, and um, there's different requirements depending on whether the person was, the child was born within wedlock versus being born outside of wedlock. So there was no, there was no discussion, there was no requirement in the statute that you demonstrate good moral character to show that you acquired U.S. citizenship at the time of birth abroad. So, um, and I also, the reason, this is a segue, I guess, um, one of the important reasons to learn about acquisition of citizenship and derivation of citizenship. If you encounter people who are currently in removal proceedings, and maybe they have certain convictions that prevent them from getting any form of relief from removal, maybe, for example, they have a conviction for an aggravated felony, but if you can prove that they acquired citizenship at the, term, at the time of birth abroad, or that they derived U.S. citizenship at a later date after birth abroad, that they're U.S. citizens, um, because a U.S. citizen is not an alien. Only aliens are subject to removal from the United States. So if you can prove they're a U.S. citizen, the government would not have jurisdiction over the person, over a U.S. citizen, to deport them from the United States. So it's very important to know, to get to, to know where to look at a minimum for the laws around acquisition of citizenship and derivation of citizenship so that if you need to, you can prove that, you know, if it's a possibility that um, your client or the or the person you're trying to help has acquired U.S. citizenship at birth, at birth abroad, um, um, that you'd be able to provide that information to them and help prevent their deportation. All right, another poll question. If the child does not apply for a certificate of citizenship by her or his 18th birthday, then she has lost the opportunity to obtain a certificate of citizenship and she must now qualify to file the form N-400 to naturalize and obtain a certificate of naturalization. So it's a true or false. So if you don't, if you've acquired U.S. citizenship abroad, at that time of birth abroad, um, I mentioned you can file the form N-600 to get proof of your U.S. citizenship. You can also apply for a U.S. passport. But if you don't do it by the, your age 18, can you still file an N-600 later on? So, um, so I'll just read it once more. If the child does not apply for a certificate of citizenship by her or his 18th birthday, then she has lost the opportunity to obtain a certificate of citizenship, and she must now qualify to file the Form N-400 to naturalize and obtain a certificate of naturalization. True or false? All right, stop. I know, yeah. Do, 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 do. Do 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 Great. And the correct answer was false. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so just to be aware of some supporting documents um, for purposes of proving or applying for um, a certificate of citizenship or filing form N-600. Um, you want to have the child's birth certificate. 
Uh, you want to have proof of the U.S. citizenship of the parents. Um, you want to have proof of the age of the parents. And you want to have the marriage certificates of the parents, if applicable. Um, you also want to have proof of the residence of, or physical presence of the parents in the United States before the child was born. And I just mentioned these because if you're, you get a call and they're trying to, and the caller asks you, well, how do I know what to prove that I have acquired U.S. citizenship? You can advise them these are things that they can look for in order to gather these sort of documentation or documents in order to bring to um, an attorney or a BIA accredited representative to get um, legal advice on it. So here's, an, an, in addition, if you want proof of residence or physical presence, here are some examples, like school, employment, military records, deeds, mortgages, leases showing residences, attestations by churches, unions, or other organizations, which ties down to the bottom one, the affidavits from third parties who have firsthand knowledge of the person residing or being physically present in the United States. Um, U.S. Social Security quarterly reports, U.S. Census records. This isn't an exhaustive list, but if you're trying to find documentation of the parents having been physically present in the United States, these are some of the things you can advise someone to gather um, to help support or prove that they've been physically present in the United States. Right. Again, I mentioned you, in order to get proof or a certificate of citizenship to prove that you acquired U.S. citizenship at birth abroad, you, you file the form N-600 application for a certificate of citizenship. Um, the current fee is $600, which is very expensive. Um, or you might be eligible to file a fee waiver if you're unable to pay the fee. Um, made payable to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And you have to submit two color photographs taken within the 30 days before you file the application. Remember, if the parents complied with the prerequisites for acquisition of citizenship, the child, even if an adult now, can file the Form N-600 at any time during his or her lifetime. So even, even if they're... 35 years old now, 50 years old now, 80 years old now, if they acquired U.S. citizenship at birth ab abroad, um, it happens automatically by operation of law, and it just comes down to them gathering the supporting documentation to submit with either the Form N-600 or the application for a U.S. passport. The current filing um, location, you always verify this on the USCIS website, it just changed within the past, I think, several months or within, I don't know, six months maybe, but... Um, it used to be that you'd file the Form N-600 locally. Now you have to file through a lockbox in Phoenix. All right, now I just want to take a moment um, just to walk through charts A and B. If you could pull it, just look, take a look at chart A first. Let me see if I have it up. I don't know if you can really tell from the left hand, in the left hand column, chart A in your manual. Um, chart A is determining whether children born outside the United States acquired citizenship at birth and if the child was born out of wedlock, we're going to look at chart B. Please note, and I'm looking at the top of the chart. You can't do them. Just it. Um, please note, a child cannot acquire citizenship at birth abroad through an adoption. So as you look at the... I'll have a pointer. Um, as you look at the chart, in the left-hand column, it says step one in the top-hand row. Step one in the left-hand column, then step two, step three, step four. So when we're talking about people acquiring U.S. citizenship at birth abroad, um, for people born within wedlock, we're looking at chart A. So in step one, it says select the period in which the child was born. So you go down, it goes from further back in time all the way down to the bottom row, is the current law regarding acquisition of citizenship. So it's for children born on or after November 14th, 1986, these are the requirements. So then you look at step two select the applicable parentage. So for any child born on or after November 14th, 1986, if both, you look at the requirement for both parents being U.S. citizens. And for that, you, then you look over to step three, it says in the top row, measure the citizen parent's residence prior to the child's birth against the requirements for that period in which the child was born. So if you look down for um, someone born to two, two U.S. citizen parents abroad, one parent had resided in the U.S. or its outlying possessions. That's the only requirement. Then we're going to skip the middle one. Just go right down, the more complicated one I said. One citizen and one alien parent, one foreign national parent. That's the most common one that you'd encounter. So the citizen parent had been physically present in the United States or its outlying possessions for at least five years. At least two of them were over the age of 14. So that's the current law for acquisition of citizenship for anyone born outside of the United States to a U.S. citizen parent in one foreign national parent um, on or after November 14th, 1986. 
All right, now I want to look at chart B. Just take a look at that. This is for children who are born abroad out of wedlock to at least one US citizen parent and one, um, and so we look, chart B, acquisition of citizenship, part one, right here. So we're looking at the right hand um, chart. It says part one, mother was a US citizen at the time of the child's birth. And then below that we have part two, is when the mother was not a US citizen. The mother was a foreign national, but the father was a US citizen. And in both situations though, the child was born out of wedlock. So for example, in part one, you look at, you look at the date of the child's birth as a step one. For any child born on or after December 24th, 1954, 1952, sorry, the requirements were, in the next column, that the mother was a U.S. citizen physically present in the United States or its outlying possessions for a continuous period of one year at some point, you know, at any point, prior to the birth of the child. So that's the only requirement for a child to acquire U.S. citizenship at birth abroad and born out of wedlock to a U.S. citizen mother the U.S. citizen mother just had to have been physically present in the United States for one continuous period at some point before the child was born. So then part two, we look down. In the left-hand column, the date of the child's birth, the current law for children born out of wedlock to a U.S. citizen father. The child born on or after November 15, 1971. Look at all the requirements. It becomes much more complicated for a child born out of wedlock to a U.S. citizen father and a foreign national mother. I'm not going to go walk through all the steps now because we don't have the time, but... So it was just an opportunity for you to, for all of us to, to look at the, um, the charts together before I do the exercises. Um, so, let me see if we do the, our first, our next poll question. All right, so Guillermo was born in Texas on January 1st, 1968. He lived in Texas. Um, until December 1986, when he was 18 years old, when he moved to Mexico, at the time when he moved to Mexico. While in Mexico, he married Agrippina, a Mexican citizen, who gave birth to Maria on April 11, 1990. Did Maria acquire U.S. citizenship at the time of birth in Mexico? So here are your options. Um, a, no, because Guillermo must demonstrate a blood relationship with Maria. And to make it easier, we're just looking at chart A. Uh, B, yes, she did acquire citizenship at birth in Mexico because Agrippina transmitted U.S. citizenship to Maria. And C, yes, Guillermo was a U.S. citizen at the time of birth. He had been physically present in the United States for at least five years, two of which were over age 14 before Maria's birth, and Maria was born within wedlock. D, no, Guillermo had needed to be physically present in the United States for at least 10 years, five of which were over age 14, but he did not have the five years after age 14. Or E, yes, because Maria did not return to live in the United States before her 18th birthday, she lost her citizenship. So take a few moments. Yes, it becomes a little bit more complicated when you have to use the charts and do the polling. All right. Yeah. All right, yeah, we can do. So we're going to... Okay. Oh, wow. And the correct answer was C. Yes. Because we're talking about Guillermo was born at Guillermo, the U.S. citizen father, Guillermo, um, married Agrippina, a Mexican citizen, so she was not, Agrippina was not a U.S. citizen, so it's one U.S. citizen parent and one foreign national parent. Um, the child, um, 
uh, Maria was born within wedlock. She was born in 1990, so we're looking at the, the current laws at the bottom in chart A. Um, and so I'm not gonna go through why the other, we don't have time to go through why the other answers were wrong. It's just that Guillermo was a US citizen at the time of Maria's birth. He had been physically present in the United States for at least five years, two of which were over the age of 14 before Maria's birth, and Maria was born within wedlock. So, she, so essentially Guillermo met the requirements um, to transmit US citizenship at the time of Maria's birth. All right, we're gonna do another, another poll question. This one, just to make it easier, this is chart B. <laughs> so, Vilma was born in the United States in 1932. In 1935, her parents and she moved to the Dominican Republic. In December 1954, Vilma gave birth out of wedlock to Oswaldo in the Dominican Republic. Oswaldo's father is a citizen of the Dominican Republic. Oswaldo is currently in removal proceedings for having a conviction for an aggravated felony. The immigration authorities are trying to deport him to the Dominican Republic. Do they have jurisdiction to deport him? In other words, is he a US citizen or not? I think you also have a, a, I believe you have, in your handout, I'm sorry, in, in your materials, you have a handout that has the options that you can look at. Has the questions, I'm sorry. Oh no, it doesn't have the options. All right, so I'll read the options. So A, no. Oswaldo was born out of wedlock to a U.S. citizen mother after December 24th, 1952. His mother had met the requirement of being physically present in the United States for one year before Oswaldo's birth. She therefore transmitted U.S. citizenship to Oswaldo at the time of his birth. Because Oswaldo is a U.S. citizen, the immigration authorities do not have jurisdiction to deport him. B, yes, because Vilma did not, had not been physically present in the United States for one year immediately preceding Oswaldo's birth, she did not transmit U.S. citizenship to him. Because he is not a U.S. citizen, the immigration authorities can have jurisdiction to deport him. C, unknown, you must first determine if the father legitimated Oswaldo. D, yes, the immigration authorities do have jurisdiction to deport Oswaldo because there is no proof of a blood relationship between Vilma and Oswaldo. Therefore, Vilma did not transmit U.S. citizenship to Oswaldo. And finally, E, yes, the immigration authorities have jurisdiction over over him because Vilma did not live in the United States for at least 10 years, five of which were after age 16. She therefore did not transmit US citizenship to Oswaldo. So you wanna take a moment and pick the correct. Okay. And the correct answer is A. So, and the answer is no, the immigration authorities do not have jurisdiction to deport Oswaldo. Um, Oswaldo was born out of wedlock to a US citizen mother after um, December 24th, 1952, his mother had met the requirement of being physically present in the United States for one year at any time before Oswaldo's birth. She therefore transmitted U.S. citizenship to Oswaldo at the time of his birth. And because Oswaldo is a U.S. citizen, the immigration authorities do not have jurisdiction to deport him. All right. Now I'm going to move on. We're going to move from acquisition of citizenship to derivation of citizenship. When a child derives her or his citizenship through one or both of, their, of his or her parents. Um, and specifically right now, I'm gonna refer to the current um, law on derivation of citizenship, which is part of the, it's under the Child Citizenship Act. So under the Child Citizenship Act of 2000, um, uh, which became effective February 27th, 2001, 
um, a child may, depending on um, either, regardless of whether it's one parent or both parents, um, may derive U.S. citizenship if the child and the parents meet certain requirements. And another nice thing about the chart, and we're going to be referring to chart C for one of the exercises. Um, chart C at the bottom row for the current law, it refers to, makes, to make it easier for callers um, or for you answering the calls, anyone who was born on or after February 28th, 1983 might be able to derive U.S. citizenship um, if they meet the requirements under the current law, under the Child Citizenship Act. And so, like acquisition of citizenship, derivation of citizenship happens automatically by operation of law if the parent and the child meet the requirements listed in the statute and the regs. In other words, you don't apply to derive U.S. citizenship. You can apply at some later point to get proof of derivation of citizenship. So under the Child Citizenship Act, um, a child may derive U.S. citizenship through a, either one or both parents, either, and the parent could be um, a U.S. citizen either by birth or naturalization. The child must be under age 18 at the time of the parent's naturalization and has to be unmarried. So the child must be under age 18 and unmarried. The child must be a lawful permanent resident. And the child must reside in the United States and in the legal and physical custody of the U.S. citizen parent or parents. So derivation of citizenship applies, um, does not apply to stepchildren because stepchildren are not included in the definition of child under nationality law in the United States. So you cannot derive U.S. citizenship um, if you are a stepchild. Now, and under the Child Citizenship Act, it doesn't matter which, um, at which point the event occurs. For example, you can, as long as they all occur before the child reaches age 18, um, before the 18th birthday. So it doesn't have to be the lawful permanent residence that you get first and then the parent naturalizing. It might be the parent naturalized first and then the child gets lawful permanent residence and, and gets into the legal custody and, and resides with the, nat the U.S. citizen parent. So it doesn't matter the, in, in which um, step the events occur as long as they all occur before the child turns age 18 under the current law. So acquisition of citizenship refers to transmitting U.S. citizenship from the parent at the time of birth abroad and derivation of citizenship refers to the child deriving U.S. citizenship through one or both parents at some point after birth, so at a later date. So in order to get proof that you have derived U.S. citizenship, you use the same form, the form N4, uh, N600, um, Application for Certificate of Citizenship. The filing fee is currently $600, or if the person is unable to pay the fee, they could submit a fee waiver request. Um, if you're trying to prove that uh, an adopted child derived U.S. citizenship through the parent, then the fee is only $550, um, made payable to the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And, and as with acquisition of citizenship, the applicant must submit um, two photographs taken within 30 days before the application is filed. So proof of citizenship of the parents must be submitted with the N-600 to prove that the child derived U.S. citizenship through a, through a um, a U.S. citizen parent. So that proof could be through the birth certificate of the U.S. citizen parent, a U.S. passport of the parent, certificate of citizenship of the parent, um, certificate of naturalization of the parent, or maybe a, a consular report of birth abroad, the form FS-240. There's also an old form you might have heard of, the form like 1350, DS-1350, which is also a, a registry of birth abroad, which is still, um, which is still valid as proof of of being a U.S. citizen. <clears throat> Other supporting documents that you submit with the Form N-600 for derivation of citizenship cases, the birth certificate of the child, um, the marriage certificates of the parents, proof of termination of any previous marriages of the parents, if applicable, such as death certificates or divorce decrees or annulment papers. You have to pr provide proof of the LPR status of the child, proof of the legal custody in case of the divorce, proof of legal custody of the child in case of divorce, um, uh, or separation or, or adoption. And then if it, there were, was an adoption, then you want to have the final adoption decree. And this is things that you, items that you could be advising callers to be gathering and getting together in order for them to bring to speak with um, you know, an immigration attorney or a BIA credit representative.
So after a child's acquisition or derivation of citizenship, a parent may apply for a certificate of citizenship on that form N-600 to the USCIS. Um, but you can also, as I mentioned previously, you can also apply for a U.S. passport. Um, and I know that many people go for the U.S. passport because it's less expensive than the um, Form N-600. But if, you're, if a person can afford both, I always recommend that they go for both because just if you get a U.S. passport, it doesn't automatically update the information or the records with the Department of Homeland Security. And granted, you, having that U.S. passport is excellent, and that would be a way to fight your case, but if you have any problems coming back into the United States after traveling, but even to avoid that, if you get a certificate of citizenship in addition to the U.S. passport, then the DHS records would be updated to reflect that too. But again, it's only, only recommended if, for situations when people can afford to do both. I understand that it could be very expensive. All right. And... And remember that, and this hasn't been a big issue lately in New York, but a U.S. passport is conclusive proof of U.S. citizenship to the same extent as a certificate of citizenship. This was a problem in the past because um, for people who are in removal proceedings um, and, and the Immigration and Customs Enforcement was trying to expel them as maybe, for example, having a conviction for an aggravated felony, um, if you tried to prove that they were a U.S. citizen by providing that U.S. passport, ICE would say in the past, oh, well, that, that's not valid. You have citation, it is, it is valid proof, conclusive proof of US citizenship. But be aware, I know that in the local office, if the Department of Homeland Security feels that a US passport was issued incorrectly, then they will reach out to the Department of State and ask them to rescind the US passport. And the US Department of State has done that. They have rescinded US passports that were incorrectly issued to people. All right, now we're just gonna take a look at chart C. If you could just look at, pull that out. Just walk through that. So you have an opportunity to look at it before we do the final poll question. So we look at the top question, the top row of chart C. In the left-hand column, it says date of last act. Unlike acquisition of citizenship, um, we're not looking necessarily at the date of birth of the child, um, we're looking at what was the last act before the child turned age 18? Did they, get, did they um, get lawful permanent residence? Did the parent naturalize? Were they in the legal custody and residing with the parent? So it could happen in different orders under the Child Citizenship Act. But remember, as you go down the rows, each row deals with a different time in the history of the United States, and there was a different law in effect at that time, and that law in effect at the last qualifying act is what controls whether or not a child derived U.S. citizenship at that time. So the current law, is in effect, as I mentioned before, the Child Citizenship Act has been in effect since February 27th, 2001. That means for anyone born on or after February 28th, 1983, it meets the following requirements, they have derived U.S. citizenship. Um, so again, I'm looking now at the bottom row, the current law on derivation of citizenship in the United States. So if you look here, and then you look over to the step two, these are the current requirements that I just went through. At least one parent is a US citizen either by birth or naturalization. In the case of a child who was born out of wedlock, the mother must be the one who is or becomes a citizen. Or, if the father is a US citizen through naturalization or other means, then the child must have been legitimated by the father under either the law of the child's residence or domicile or the law of the father's residence or domicile. And the legitimation must take place before the child's 16th birthday. Um, and then letter C, the next requirement, the child has to be under age 18. Letter D, the child must be unmarried. Letter E, the child is a lawful permanent resident. Um, and letter F, the child is residing in the U.S. in the legal and physical custody of the citizen parent. And there's a separate requirement for adopted children that we won't go into here for time requirements. Um, so now I want to move on to the next poll question. May Lin was born in wedlock in China on April 11th, 2000. Um, she, had, she and both her parents were admitted to the United States as lawful permanent residents in March 2004 and settled in New York, where they currently live. In March 2010, May's parents divorced under New York law, and through the divorce, May's mother obtained legal custody of May. May is unmarried and continues to live with her mother. Who, who continues to live with her mother, who naturalized um, in March 2011. Did May derive U.S. citizenship? So I'll just go through the, uh, the options. A, 
Yes, she did, because when May's mother naturalized in March 2011, May was unmarried, under age 18, a lawful permanent resident, and living in the legal and physical custody of her mother. B, yes, May automatically derived U.S. citizenship through her father when she was admitted to the U.S. as a lawful permanent resident. C, no, because May's father was also required to naturalize in addition to the naturalization of May's father. D, yes, because May and her mother had at least five years of continuous permanent residence in the United States before the mother naturalized. Or E, no, because her parents obtained a divorce before the mother naturalized. So if you want to take a moment, what is the, which one is the correct answer? Correct. And the correct answer was A. <laughs> um, because May's mother naturalized in March 2011, May was unmarried, under age 18, and an a lawful permanent resident, and living in the legal and physical custody of her mother. She derived um, U.S. citizenship when her mother naturalized. So with that, actually, um, comes the end of my presentation. And then we're going <laughs> to... Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Um, so this gets us to our Q&A session. Um, and we have Mr. Boyle and Professor Warnick coming up to take. So the first set of questions are going to be questions related to naturalization, acquisition, and derivation. Um, so we have Monique. Um, and we have Maggie um, on both sides. And they will be asking questions and then we will we'll turn it over to our panelists. Ready? Start. Monique? Alrighty. Can adopted children acquire U.S. citizenship? Can you repeat that? Can adopted children acquire citizenship? So, Tom? No. no. Okay. Maggie? Well, just, just to be clear, he answered the question absolutely right, but they can derive citizenship. Right. Yes, that's right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Maggie? Cli client has been in LPR for over 16 years. He can't remember all of his trips outside of the U.S. that he took since he became an LPR. He's in possession of his current passport that he got in 2001, but he doesn't have any of his old passports, and he can't check his trips from the past. Will he have a problem applying for naturalization? Sounds William? like one of my clients is in the audience. <laughs> so when did you say he got his green card? 16 years ago. Okay. And his current passport goes back how far? 2001. Okay, so he can list at least the last five years, which is good. Um, if he's, you said he's lost the passport from before? Yeah. Okay, so usually what I would do in that situation is have him include a note with his application saying that he's lost the passport and he can't provide the trips, but that from memory, he can't remember, he has not taken any trips longer than six months. All right. Mary came in without inspection at two years old. She was adopted by her naturalized citizen grandmother at age 15. She never got a green card. She's now 23 years old. Is she a U.S. citizen? Professor Warnick, would you like to take that? No, because she was never a permanent resident. So to derive citizenship, you have to have been a permanent resident and become a permanent resident before the age of 18. So since she was never a permanent resident, she cannot derive from her parents. Thank you. Maggie? An N-600 was denied in 2006 because of insufficient proof of the father's residency with the child. 
No appeal was filed. Now the applicant has gathered enough supporting documents to prove acquisition of citizenship. Can this person file a motion to reconsider the previous decision, or can this person file a new N-600? Tom? Uh, well, I had just looked at the regs. I think that they would have to do a motion to reopen, but I'm not sure. I'm not positive. I'm going to have to double check, because I think either you, you have to appeal right away, and if you pass that up, then you have to do the motion to reopen. Um, and, I don't, and if you have to do the motion to reopen, then you can't file a new N-600. But I'm not sure what steps had to be taken first before you eliminate the option of filing again. Does that make sense? So remember, we're talking about there's a difference between acquisition and derivation, right? So I, I assume, here, here's my point of view, which not every lawyer agrees with, I will tell you that. But based on Tom's presentation, you know, when he pointed out that a U.S. passport is proof of U.S. citizenship for all purposes, I, I, I tend to discourage people from applying for certificates of citizenship. If a person's a citizen, let them get a U.S. passport. It's cheaper, it's faster, and the pe people in the Department of State, that's their specialty, so they know more about the law. Now, sometimes you can have a problem at a particular passport office, but if you see a supervisor or you insist, usually you can get over. And then when the person's a, person's a U.S. citizen, if they want to bother with trying to get a certificate, you know, once they have proof of U.S. citizenship, which is a U.S. passport, if they want to, you know, if they want a certificate to put on their wall, that's fine. But, you know, the, the only disadvantage that I've, that I've heard that makes sense to me about the certificate versus the, I mean, the passport versus certificate is the passport has to be renewed and the certificate does not. But it's a small price to pay, it seems to me. First of all, you could get three passports for what it costs to get one certificate. So that's like 30 years worth of being a U.S., uh, you know, proof of U.S. citizenship. And God, God willing, you live that long. I, I don't see why you need the certificate. Not a, I should tell you, not every lawyer agrees, but I never, ever have recommended anyone ever get a certificate of citizenship. And I've done okay. And can I add, Maggie, just to, as a side, because I did, I knew I just looked at this, like for a separate, if, if I'm responding to the question but as I understood it. Um, in the regulations at section 320, there is a, there is a provision that if, you, if your N-600 is denied, um, that you're supposed to be told the reasons why it's denied and an opportunity to appeal, and if you miss the appeal, um, you can't file the N-600 again. Um, and you would have to file for a, a, submit a request for a motion to reopen. And that's section 320.58 CFR. <laughs> Thank okay, you. and that's even if it's beyond the 30 days that you're given to appeal? I believe so, yeah. Okay, I think so too. The, the other thing is that sometimes the certificate is required by the federal government if you're applying for a job, or even by the NYPD to prove citizenship. They won't accept a U.S. passport. Well, let me just say that, uh, first of all, the NYPD, that, that position was uh, through the great help of uh, Matilda Roman. That's no longer true. You can become a, a member of the police force without being without showing a certificate of citizenship. So that's, that's, that's something that has been well publicized because I wasn't sure whether it was like inside or outside information, but now that I know, I was told just about 15 minutes ago that this is very public information, so you'll be reading it in my column soon. Um, as to the federal government, you know, uh, if, if that's the case, then you, you try and get a certificate, but, what, but I also think what we need to do is what we did with the, what we did with the police department is basically call them on it. It's just wrong. It's just there's, there's, no, there's no legitimate, I don't think there's any legitimate reason why the federal government, which is the same government that issued the passport, can now require a separate document. No, I agree with you. I'm just pointing out that that's no. been their practice up until now. Yeah, it, it may be, that very well may be a problem. But still, what you, what you want to do is if you have a, a case that's, con so I don't want to disagree with Liam. I mean, I think he made a very good point. Um, the, the, the one thing I would say, though, is Still, nevertheless, even if you're applying for a federal job, it's better to get the passport first because it puts you in a much better position when you go to contest with USCIS uh, over the certificate because now there's already been a federal government agency that have, has adjudicated you as a U.S. citizen. Thank you. Next question, please. At the time of applying for citizenship, if you've convicted a crime, is it true that the government is not deporting anyone? Say that again. At the time of applying for citizenship and I've convicted a crime, is it true that the government is not deporting anyone? Um, it's not true that the government's not deporting anyone. I don't really understand the question, but there's no kind of 
exemption <laughs> just because you submitted an application, if that's the question? And I think that's one of the ways that the government finds people to put them in to removal proceedings is because they filed an application and they, you know, with the immigration authorities that, you know, when they had a, something yeah. that made them ineligible for the, uh, the applicant for the benefit. You know, the other thing about criminal records is that we do these events. I mean, it, it, it's our pressure. For instance, let's say we, CUNY Citizenship Now does an event. Very often, if a person has a criminal record, we'll require that they bring in full documentation and, and, and let us in a calm environment where we have access to our law books, review it. So during the call-in, if somebody says, I was arrested, how is this going to impact my right to become a U.S. citizen, permanent resident, or any other benefit? The recommendation should be to visit one of, to get their complete criminal record, and, and there's information in the uh, in your handbook on how to do that, and that they should visit with uh, a legal professional who's knowledgeable about these matters and have them review it. Thank you. Maggie? Can someone applying for naturalization add a son on the application despite the fact that the son was not mentioned on the green card application? Or can this be considered misrepresentation? Liam, will uh, you take that question, please? That's kind of a difficult one to answer here. Um, it depends how they got their green card. I mean, if they got their green card on the basis of marriage and the child that they didn't declare was the product of another relationship, then I would think that that would be a material misrepresentation and that, that, that might be a reason why that person should not apply for naturalization. But it's a really hard question to answer here with very basic facts. That's something that you would want to have a lot more discussion about. Thank you. Honey? John is an LPR since 1980. In 1984, he pled guilty to possession of three pounds of marijuana. He was sentenced to a year in probation, but never jailed. One, is his green card, his green card has expired in 2002. Can he apply for renewal without facing deportation? Two, can he apply for US citizenship? And three, if he cannot, is there any waivers available for him? That all fit on one card? Yes, oh. it did. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, would you care to take that question? No, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the, I wouldn't know how to speak to the immigration consequences of the, of the criminal behavior. So I wouldn't, that's the first thing that would, I would have to look into. And I just don't know enough about it to say whether or not that makes the person deportable. But if it did, then you don't want to file the application for naturalization. So refer but I just to an don't expert. know. I don't know if it does make them deportable. Let, let, let me give you like a, so let me imagine since it does. we have time since we have we, we have still have 40 minutes before the wine starts flowing let me uh, <laughs> let me try to let me try to give a, a an answer to that so if it if a person has been you know it's certainly a deportable offense with no waiver available for a person to be convicted of more than uh, of 30 grams or more of marijuana so the person's deportable if they file for naturalization and as is probably would happen, if the examiner came to the attention of the examiner, the person had a deportable offense, a removable offense, they would probably refer that person for removal proceedings. Then you have to figure out, is there any remedy in removal proceedings? So I don't want to go beyond that, but there may be a remedy in removal proceedings. But that's how you have to, that's how it would play out in real life. The person would file, they'd get sent for removal proceedings, and then they'd have to deal with the immigration judge to see whether a remedy would be existed. And we don't, I don't want to go into the, all the rules regarding that, but that's how I think it would play out. Thank you. Next question, please. Me or Mike? How does immigration know if you've ever been arrested? No. Any one well, of our panelists can answer that first question. First of all, you're, you're supposed to tell them. If you decide not to tell them, you are fingerprinted for most types of applications. The fingerprints are sent to the FBI, and that's generally how it comes to light. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. If someone has a re-entry permit and stays outside the U.S. for a year and a half, how long do they have to wait before they can apply for NATS? Four years and a day. You said it's a year and a half? Yes, a year and a half. So generally, if you're absent for more than one year with a re-entry permit, because that preserves their green card, then they have to wait for four years and one day from the date they return. Yep. Right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Unless they're married to a U.S. citizen and been married to and living with the same U.S. citizen spouse, then it would be two years and one day. Because that's half the time. I'm sorry? Because that's half the time. Because, well, if you need five years continuous residence and the Immigration Service gives you one year for the first day, 
If you need five years, you have four years in one day. Right. If you need three years, you have two years in one day. Okay, so that part has always confused me and I always have to write it down. That's why I asked. <laughs> Maggie. Can a child acquire citizenship if the parents are citizens but they weren't born in the U.S.? They naturalized. Can they acquire? Yeah, can they acquire citizenship through parents who na are naturalized citizens? Good question. So, um, if, the, if I understand the question correctly, so if the parents are both naturalized parents and then the child was born, yes, the child could acquire U.S. citizenship if the parents meet the physical presence requirements in the United States before the child was born. They have to meet all the requirements. So that's different than, I just want to make sure I clarify, than, someone, than derivation, someone who was born outside the United States and then later on both one or both parents naturalized. Then at that point you don't acquire U.S. citizenship. They have to meet certain requirements to derive U.S. citizenship. So there's no discrimination between U.S. born citizens and naturalized citizens? For, for acquisition. For acquisition. Right. Okay. Thank you. Next question, please. If someone acquires U.S. citizenship at birth after being born outside to USC parents in a foreign country, can they ever become president? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Warnick, I'm gonna I'm gonna give that one to you. Yes. yes. That was John McCain. Born Just in one Panama. example. He ran Panama. for president and it was never really challenged his citizenship. He was born in Panama. His parents were U.S. citizens. He didn't acquire it because you know there's this there's this fiction, there's this street fiction about somehow, you know, if you're born in the Panama Canal Zone, you're a U.S. citizen. That's not true. So he was born, he was, or if you're born on a military base, you know, th th those, those things are just fiction. So he was born to two, issue, two U.S. citizen parents. He acquired U.S. citizenship at birth, and he almost became president. There you go. Thank you. Maggie? Can a person file an N-400 and an N-600 at the same time? No. Liam? I don't think so, no. No. It's my understanding, if, if the person's applying for themselves, for herself or himself, um, if the person has already acquired U.S. citizenship or derived U.S. citizenship, then the, the USCIS would reject the Form N-400 because they don't have jurisdiction to, to adjudicate something for a U.S. citizen. So. After naturalization, can you, you, can you lose your U.S. citizenship? Yes. I mean, it's, it's rare that that happens, but yes, if you, if you lied on the application, if you lied when you got your green card, or, I mean, the, the most common example I can think of is, you know, Nazis. If you were, right. the only time I can think of somebody being denaturalized in recent history is somebody who's a former Nazi prison guard or something like that, and they, you know, that's still a reason that you are Deportable, it's a reason you can't get a green card, and it's definitely a reason that you can't be a U.S. citizen. So if you lie about that and they find out, they can certainly take it away. And there's, and there's also um, a process, I don't know the steps to it, that you could, um, you could renounce your U.S. citizenship. And I, I don't know the steps to go through that, but I know there's a process for that. You have to go to a U.S. embassy abroad and formally renounce it. Mm -hmm. I have a client who tried it once. Oh. I don't know if it's a true story, but he apparently went to two different embassies in Europe and tried it, and they wouldn't let him do it because he would then be stateless. But it's kind of beyond the scope of this training today. <laughs> Thank you. Can someone who commits an aggravated felony after they become a citizen be deported? Oh, I don't you know, just to, this to sort of follow up on the last question, I mean, th th there's almost nothing you can do other than formal renunciation these days to, pardon me, to lose your citizenship once, a, once lawfully acquired. The example of the Nazis, these are people who made a false, misre made a misrepresentation of material fact in acquiring either permanent residence or U.S. citizens. Then you can be denaturalized. But there's almost nothing you can do after becoming a citizen that can result in the losing of citizenship. And that's, that's not, you know, if you read the stuff on the USCIS website and other and Department of State websites, it's not articulated so clearly as that. But if you look at the case law, um, it, it pretty much is pretty clear. It used to be that if you joined a foreign army or if you joined a foreign government or you, even if you voted in a foreign election, but now unless you, and even then, even if you formally renounce, a lot of times you go and say, well, I didn't really know that if I formally renounced, I was going to, you know, that I was going to lose this right. And then you say, okay, we'll give your citizenship back. Thank you. An LPR child is sent to live in another country, attends primary school. Is there any problems for that child when they return to become a citizen? 
What was the question again? If you're an LPR child, you go back to another country for primary school, have you abandoned citizenship, and can, when you come back, can you apply for citizenship? Well, how, how long have they been out? Like more than a year? Or? Let's just say 10 years. Yeah, well, they're under the age yeah, of 18. Yeah. Under so the age of 18. Th and they're under the age of 18. Yes. They can definitely, I mean, the immigration service can definitely allege that they've abandoned their residence. Whether they actually succeed in taking it away is another thing. But yes, it's definitely a, a serious problem. Yeah. And can I add to that? I, I, the idea of, the, of lawful permanent residence is that you have your principal actual dwelling place, your residence in the United States and not in another country. So something being out of the United States for 10 years, it's going to be hard to prove that you know, that your residence was in the United States. And I realize it's for a child, but it oh, could be so very I, difficult. You know, this is why Justice Ginsburg said that immigration law is one of the toughest areas of law, of any area of law in the United States. It's because it's, it's very complicated and not everyone agrees. My, my interpretation would be slightly different. I would say this. I would say that if the child was underage, if the child had strong ties, in other words, let's say the parents were in the United States, so that it was clear that there was an intention for the child to go to school and then return. And I think the child might be able to then uh, return to the United States. Now, he, as a permanent resident, the procedure, by the way, would be for the child to go to a U.S., the preferred procedure would be for the child to go to a U.S. consulate and apply for a special immigrant returning resident visa. And provide the documentation of the facts that I described. Or the other, the other possibility, which is a little bit more hairy, is for the child to just show up at the airport with a green card and say, you know, I was out of the United States for 10 years, but I was attending school, and uh, have the parents meet him and see what happens. Especially if the child is still underage, it might, it might work out. But I would say in, in either, I don't prefer that latter way. I'm not recommending it, but I know people have done it and, and it had some success with it. Um, and I'll just tell you a, a true story, just to give you an example. It's something, it's a true story, but I use it in my classes. So this woman uh, had a severe medical problem, a young woman, uh, you know, young, like in, the tw in her early 20s, but she had a severe medical problem and she couldn't afford, didn't have any health insurance, so she returned to her homeland, was, which was in Scandinavia, and was there for seven years. And uh, she, she called, I, I, through a friend, I spoke to her over the phone, I led her through the process, she went to the U.S. consulate, she got a returning resident visa because she was able to establish the facts that I described, which is that she had a severe medical condition, she needed treatment, she had to be, that she could only get it abroad because of insurance and she was able to come back. So, what I would say about the kid uh, going to school, I would say it's not an easy case, but it's not, a, to me, it's also not a clear case of abandonment. The problem is, is, it, is that, we, I don't know if this was talked about because I had to step out for a few minutes, but you know, when you go to the U.S. consulate, there's no, re there's no enforceable legal review of the consular officer's decision. So if the consular officer refuses to grant the, the returning resident visa, you have a right to an advisory opinion with the U.S. Department of State, but it is, it's not like you can go to federal court like you could do if the person was in the United States and was denied a benefit. So not to say, not to say that Liam is wrong, but to say that, you know, there, 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 sometimes, sometimes you try things and it may not work out, but it's certainly, I wouldn't give up on a case like that. I'm not saying they're going to get it, but I certainly wouldn't give up. Yeah, I think it's another example of if you get a call like that at the call and then somebody asks you a question about being outside the U.S. for 10 years, that's something you're probably not going to solve on the phone. I mean, I, I would, yeah. at least I would right. definitely want to know where the parents were during that 10 years, did they go with the child or did they stay here and send the child home? It's definitely not something that can be solved on the phone. Thank you. Monique? All righty. U.S. citizenship is one of the minimum requirements to apply for federal jobs. Can dual citizenship pose any problems during the recruitment process? I don't think it should. I've never heard of it. I don't think it should be a problem. You're a U.S. citizen. The other thing about dual citizenship, recall, is that dual citizenship is a function of the laws of the foreign country, not of the United States, so it shouldn't have any impact on it at all. It's not the United States that grants dual citizenship. It's the Italian government or the French government or the Israeli government or the Canadian government or the British government that allows for dual citizenship, not the U.S. government. U.S. government, you're a US, they consider you a U.S. citizen when you naturalize, and you must renounce all foreign citizenships. So you raise your hand, you say, I renounce all foreign citizenships, and then, if Italy wants to say, oh yeah, he's still an Italian, that's up to Italy, but, has no, but it's, not a US, it's not a U.S. adjudication, it's an Italian adjudication. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. 
They still expect you to travel with your U.S. passport if that's going to be the follow-up question. Maggie? Can someone who renounces his U.S. citizenship transmit citizenship to his children? I doubt it. I doubt you have to be a U.S. citizen at the time you transmit your U.S. citizenship. So if the child is born after that, then I doubt it, but I don't know the answer. Yeah, you're right. I doubt it right. You're not much. a U.S. citizen. You're not a U no, it's you're either are or you aren't, right? <laughs> so, so that's the point about the passport and the certificate. Mm -hmm. You are or you aren't. You're either a U.S. citizen or you're not a U.S. citizen. You're a U.S. citizen. You're a U.S. citizen. If you're not, you're not. If it's an effective renunciation, which, like I said, very few of them are, but if it's an effective renunciation, then you're no longer a U.S. citizen and you have no rights or benefits. You can't petition for your mother, for instance. Thank you. Monique? All right. This is an easy one. Right. Um, can the child of parents who they themselves acquire citizenship get citizenship to the parents? The uh, let's repeat the if question, they're... please. Can the child of parents who acquired citizenship also get U.S. citizenship? Enzo. So, um, yes, it's, it is possible. If I understand the question, let me just restate it. Is it possible for the child to become a U.S. citizen when the parents have acquired U.S. citizenship? Yes, it is possible, but that child, if you're talking about acquisition of citizenship, that child, the parents who acquired U.S. citizenship, in turn, would have to meet the requirements for acquisition in order to transmit that sh citizenship through acquisition, if, that's, if you're referring to acquisition of citizenship. Thank you, Tom. Maggie? Okay. So in other words, it can. Sometimes part of the intake for clients, and I'm not ta necessarily talking about callers at the hotline, but um, when you're inquiring about acquisition of citizenship, not only do you ask about the parents, but you'd ask about the grandparents, um, because sometimes it's possible that the grandparents had transmitted citizenship to the parents, who in turn transmitted citizenship to the child. Thank you, Tom. Maggie? Okay, I'm out of naturalization citizenship questions, so I'm going to pick up with some adjustment questions that were left over from the morning. If you entered the United States without inspection, is there any way for you to get a green card without leaving? Professor Warnick or William, would you care to? Well, <laughs> yeah, there are, there, are, there are a few. Well, so one, if you're 245I eligible, which, we, which was talked about before, which is that either you start a case by January 14th, 1996, is that correct? Uh, is it 96 or 98? 98. 98. Or you were here in the United States um, on December 20th, and you started a, 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 per, a family or employment case by uh, J uh, April 30th, 2001. Just one example, asylum, uh, the uh, Violence Against Women Act, if you qualify under that, you don't have to, you can adjust status. Uh, we talked about special immigrant juveniles very briefly today. So, but as a general rule, unless you're, th those are all exceptions to the general rule, and the general rule is if you enter without inspection, you cannot adjust status. And I just have a follow-up question. For people who are 245i, is there a fee waiver for the 245i fee? That's $1,000, the penalty? Uh, there, there are no fee waivers in any employment or family-based uh, immigration case. And what the Immigration Service has said about that is that if, because there's an affidavit of support required in a family case and because there's work required in an employment case, then you cannot get a fee waiver. So. Um, that's, just their, that's just their position, and so it is what it is. And can I also add, if, you're, if I understood what you're getting at, for the $1,000 fine that you pay for 245i, because it's not a fee, it's a fine, that they, they won't waive that either. Thank you. If you don't have any papers but work off the books, do you have to file taxes? You should call the IRS and find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we... I, this... Um, uh, I never answer tax, tax questions, not specific No, ones the, the only reason, the only reason, that's a good answer. That's the answer I would normally give uh, in most cases, but because we're going to be on the phones and, and we, we, we should be uh, careful about what we say, so the correct answer is that if the law requires you to pay taxes, you must pay taxes regardless of whether you're documented or not and regardless of the, of the source of that income. So it depends on how much money you made. Um, and that's the law, and people say, well, you know, and if people say, well, what happens if I don't? Again, it's what, it's what I said this morning. You know, if you do something, if you violate the law and no one finds out about it, nothing bad happens to you. But if you violate the law and someone finds out about it, something bad is going to happen to you. So uh, the obligation to pay taxes is separate from 
your immigration status with the exception of individuals who are lawful non-immigrants. In some case, they can avoid certain taxes. And this is where I definitely, I'm not going to take any follow-up questions because I don't know anything about it. But there are, there are people who file as non-residents. The problem with that is if you file as a non-resident, it could interfere with your right to become a U.S. citizen later, right, because you have to show continuous residence. So, um, but generally, everybody has to, every, you know, you know, die, everybody has to die and everybody has to pay taxes. <laughs> um, next question. Uh, Alan, I just want to follow up. I think one of the benefits of filing taxes, even if you might not be required to, is it's evidence that you've been in the United States. Yeah. Yeah, that, yes. Th there are several benefits to filing taxes. I mean, maybe we should just talk about this real quickly. I mean, that's a, that's a very, thank you, Maggie, that's a very important one because we, we're hoping that someday there will be some kind of immigration reform or a person might have some uh, benefit like cancellation removal if they've been here 10 years, which requires showing physical presence in the United States. And so having, having filed tax returns is a good way to do it. Also, you should know that if you use an individual tax identification number and your employer reports your income or you pay into Social Security as, a, as, a, as an independent contractor, that later if you become a permanent resident, the Social Security Administration will reconcile your, your, your records and so that you will, uh, your, that time that you've paid into the system will count towards your uh, t 40 quarters that you need in order to qualify for retirement and other benefits. Can I also add on? I'm sorry. I was just going to say it's a common misconception that being unlawfully in the U.S. exempts you from paying tax. And it's also a misconception that people who are here without status don't pay taxes. You can, and many do. So it's a common thing that I hear every year, just to point it out. And can I just add on about the paying taxes to prove that your physical presence in the United States, for example, for cancellation removal, I also know that's um, sometimes looked at for purposes of demonstrating good moral character. Like that you're, you're paying your taxes, so they would, it looks, and so touching upon something else that Alan said, uh, if there is a um, immigration reform, like a legalization program in the future, and the fact that you're paying your taxes now to prove your physical presence in the United States, who knows also if that could be used in discretionary terms for saying, oh, you've been paying your taxes, so, you know, in, take that into consideration for a discretionary grant of legalization because for good moral character issues, not necessarily that there'd be good moral character issues but the best a answer is just it's the law. I mean, you know, people ask you on the phone, do I have to pay tax? You say, yes, it's the law. Can I also add, though, I get a lot of questions tied to the taxes. Oh, if I pay my taxes, can I get my green card? Do I get some sort of immigration benefit for that? No, paying taxes in and of itself does not lead to getting an immigration benefit. And that's a con I get that a lot. Great. Thank you. Next question, please. Why is it that immediate relatives can't bring their derivatives to the U.S.? It's just the way the statute's written. They're not allowed to have derivatives. Most people think it's a drafting error. I mean, I, I, you know, I, this is the kind of question I get in my column. And, and you know, I, I tried to research as best I could, and most people think it was a drafting error. In other words, some numbskulls who were writing the immigration law just didn't think to put it in there. And since then, there have been some efforts to get Congress to change that, but those efforts have been relatively recent. And the problem is, is that Congress doesn't want to do anything right by immigrants these days, so they don't want to do anything that's going to give more people green cards. But it was a mistake. That's what most legal historians think. It was just a mistake. Maggie? If someone lost their certificate of citizenship and is now receiving public benefits, can that person get a fee waiver for a replacement certificate of citizenship? Yeah. I would Questions say yes. to either William or Tom? Well, can I would say that, that, yeah, they would have to meet the requirements for the fee waiver, but yeah, if they're receiving a means-tested public benefit, that would be one of the eligibility requirements for demonstrating that their inability to pay the, the fee for replacement. Great, thank you. Monique? Alan, a question for you. Are the questions- you Personally? Yeah, personally. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> we, call the, we, call this, we call this stump the lawyer. You have to have Are a countdown. <laughs> That's an easy question. Go ahead. Are the questions in the call-in mostly in Spanish? Are the what? Are the callers to the call mostly Hispanic? Yeah. Uh, gosh. The I, is that from Fox News? Just explain <sighs> the process. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember, actually. Uh, I think it's, it's pretty close to 50-50. We, we do have a lot of uh, probably more Spanish callers uh, than any other language, including English. Am, am I right, Monique? Uh, yes, Sophia? you are. 
Because I'm right about visit. Monique yes. knows that. So <laughs> that's great. So I was right. Thank you. I passed that test. And that's why, by the way, if you if you are Spanish speaking and you signed up in the morning, we'd really love it if you could come and change to the afternoon. First of all, the afternoon is like way more fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Four to seven. Then the morning. Um, Maggie? If you get religiously married in another country to a U.S. citizen, can that U.S. citizen sponsor you? I think, Liam? I mean, if it's considered legal in that country, then I would, I would say yes, but you're going to have to get some sort of documentary evidence of the marriage, a certificate of some sort, but yes. Thank you. Monique? That's a weird one. What about Native Americans that would travel without a U.S. passport and are now are no, not allowed to travel with their tribal passports? What should they do? Ooh, that's, a, that's a question for Professor wow. Warnick. Yeah, <laughs> that's a question. You know, I was asked, by the way, believe it or not, I've been asked this question before. Oh, and I said then that I didn't know the answer. And I still don't know the answer. <laughs> um, and, and the reason I don't know the answer, if a person has a U.S. in other words, it's, it's sort of like a, more of a political question, a political problem. A person has a U.S. passport, has, I, I'm a pragmatist. A person has a, a U.S. passport and is able to go back and forth, do whatever they want, I'm not going to spend my time trying to figure out how, how they can get some other document. Now, from a political point of view, I would love, and I don't mean to belittle the question, so from a political point of view, if whoever asks that would like to provide me some you know, references, information, about the political problem, I could get interested from a political point of view, but not so much from a legal point of view. But I know that's a concern. I mean, I've read, I've read and heard that there is some, uh, con some problem on the border, particularly I think on the Canadian border, with people who are, are, are uh, Native Americans having trouble uh, getting in and out of the United States. And if it's wrong, then something ought to be done about it. Maggie? Can a U.S. citizen file a petition for a four-year-old niece? No. Uh, no. All right, Nick. Back on dual citizenship, can a naturalized citizen vote, continue to vote in their foreign country's election? I think it wouldn't that depend on the, uh, the law of the foreign country? Mm -hmm. It would. Yeah, I mean, it would depend on the, the fact that the press is a dual citizen and that, that people who but are U.S. I citizens. Think the and essence of the, I think the essence of the question is will it affect their U.S. citizenship? And the answer is no. Was a very, that was the first, the first Supreme Court case that really took a hit against the denaturalization that was quite common by our government. You know, one time, if you were a U.S. citizen and you married a foreigner, if you were a woman, you could, loo you could lose your U.S. citizenship by having married a foreigner. Um, so the first case that, I mean, I'm just saying this because we have time and, uh, you know, it, it seems like uh, people want to talk about more political things, but. The very first case involved a man who voted in an Israeli election. He was a dual citizen, and the U.S. government tried to take his citizenship away, and they said, no, you can't do that. And that was the beginning of a trend. Like I said, up until now, almost anything you do, if you could be prime minister of, of England and, and not lose your U.S. citizenship. I don't know if you can be prime minister of England if you're, if you're a dual citizen, but um, assuming you could, you, you cannot lose your citizen. Here's one for you. I don't have the answer to I gave. I, 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 here's one for you, so for your intellectual curiosity. If, you be, if you're a British citizen, you become a U.S. citizen, can you, become, can you be knighted like Paul McCartney was knighted? I, I don't know the answer, but I was asked that by a client once. So something to think about. <laughs> Good example. Um, next question. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm entertaining myself, not you. <laughs> People always wake up more when we talk about celebrities. He's getting ready for the wine reception in a few minutes. Um, Maggie? The U.S. Senate has yet to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. If it expires, how would current immigration law be affected? Um, that's a good question. Which act? Violence Vala. Against Vala. Women. Yeah, Vala. Tom. Tom. I would think that would be, I mean, if, this, if that's the the provision that permits victims of domestic violence to self-petition, then that would be a huge, huge loss and impact in the uh, immigrant community for immigrant victims of domestic violence. They wouldn't have that, uh, if, if I understand the question correctly, they would eliminate the opportunity for immigrant victims of domestic violence to obtain permanent residence by not having to rely on their abuser. It would be horrible. I double dare them to do it. I'm curious as to where that question came from. Does somebody know something that the rest of us don't? 
So we have insider <laughs> links in Washington. A question from Twitter. What are the penalties on an undocumented individual has to pay when applying to adjust their status to, a resi to permanent resident via spouse sponsorship? Can you repeat that for me? I'm all <laughs> what are the penalties that the undocumented individual has to pay when applying to, a, to adjust their status to permanent resident via spouse sponsorship? It's like a 245i case, I presume? I would assume. Um, okay, $1,000. The thousand dollar penalty, the current fee to adjust your status is 1070 and the fee to file a petition is 420. And as a disclaimer, all the fees are available to see on the USCIS website. Um, those are the basic fees for that type of application, if I understand the question correctly. Of course, remember, if the person entered legally, was inspected and admitted, then there is no penalty because if they're married to a US citizen, they qualify as an immediate relative and then they don't have to pay the thousand dollars. Exactly. Great. Um, next question, please. So I'm not going to ask the question. I think it's written a little bit confusing. But I think the, the question is, for the, the test when you take when you're applying for naturalization, what is the difference in the test for native English speakers and, for example, a native Spanish speaker? Somebody who's had their green card at least five years and then somebody who qualifies under the 15, 55, or 50, 20 rule. Like, what does the test look like for each of those applicants? So. So the 1555 and the 5020, they exempt you from the, the requirement that you demonstrate literacy in English. So are you, say, are you asking if, if the person who's applying na English as their native language, whether the test is different? I mean... Does a native English speaker have to prove that they can read and write English even beyond the 1555? I don't think so. I, mean, I would say no. Right. That's correct. If, if, you're ex if you're exempt from the English writing and speaking uh, uh, and reading requirement, you don't have to uh, answer, you don't have to speak any, read, write, or speak any language. Is that, is that the question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, the question is if you're illiterate, if, if the question is if you're illiterate, once you're 55 years of age and you have 15 years permanent residence, you can naturalize. Right. We have a few minutes left, and so we'll just ask a few more questions. If Monique, can you ask All the right. next question? If someone's green card is expired, does she or she need to renew this before applying for U.S. citizenship? That's a question for Tom. Tom. Well, the, the actual formal instructions in the, the guide to naturalization say that if it's, I believe if you've applied more than six months before your green card expires, then you do not have to renew it, but if you apply within um, six months of the card about to expire, or if the card is already expired, then you have to renew it. Um, now I know locally, in the New York office, they've indicated that you can make an info pass appointment and get a temporary proof of permanent residence in your valid passport, and they would accept that. But that, I only understand that as being in New York. I don't know what it's like at other district offices. But um, so I first had to tell you what the rule is in the guide to naturalization. That's what the requirement is. And separately, just be aware that there is a, the law requires that if you are a lawful permanent resident, you're expected to carry your, your valid, unexpired green card with you. And if you don't, it's a misdemeanor. Um, and also, you may, unless, you know, if you're going to be looking for work, you, know, the, you may need that um, valid, unexpired green card in order to prove that you are authorized to work in the United States. But, but some, just, just some to, things to consider. Just to emphasize the practical implication, I mean, what Tom said was absolutely accurate, so, but the practical implication is that the answer is no. So as a practical matter, in this district anyways, you can naturalize without having renewed your card. Maggie? Okay. Angela is a U.S. citizen and she marries John. She files a petition for John and John has an interview at the U.S. consulate in DR. John failed to answer one question right about his relationship with Angela, and his visa was denied. Now John's mother is a U.S. citizen and wants to file for John. Can she do it? Will John face any problems at the visa interview? Question for Liam. Again, that's a very specific question. Um, I think I would want to know what the question was that he got wrong. Um, Again, if it's a material misrepresentation, when you say it's about his marriage to Angela. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't the, able to prove the bona fides and it okay, was I mean, on I, that basis. My instinct would be to say no, that it shouldn't stop him from getting a green card or an immigrant visa through his mother. Um, 
I would say no. But again, I would need to know more facts. Thank you. Wanna How long is a Form I-130, okay, let me restart. Form I-130 for green card was approved, daughter for father. How long is it valid? How many years? You mean the approval? Yeah. Until it's revoked? I presume. Until it's revoked. As long as it hasn't been revoked, it's still valid. Mm -hmm. And as long as that family, the qualifying family relationship still exists. Oh, yeah. Do you have any, no allowed. more questions? Is, are there any questions left? Two. Great. Oh, you have no more questions, right? Mm -hmm. It's on you. All right, H-1B question. Oh, geez. How does a person with an H-1B obtain a green card? Um, does he or she need to leave the country? Not if they're in status. I mean, if they're applying to adjust their status from H-1B to green card, then no. Right, there's a dual intent doctrine. Right, that they don't, it's different for like F-1s and J-1s. They have to show that they're they're not intending to live in the U.S. permanently. But if somebody's in H-1B status and they have been for a number of years, their employer sponsors them or they win the DV lottery or they get their green card some other way, as long as they've been in status, they, they don't need to leave the country to adjust. Was that the question? Yes, that was the question. And the final I question? I think it's a comment. Um, mm -hmm. DHS is revoking citizenships of persons who have been convicted for the sale of drugs. There's a young man now in Boston who's awaiting deportation. I don't know what the question is. That doesn't seem to be a question. So thank you all for wait, wait, wait. going to Q&A. Uh, before before, before we conclude, remark, yes, right? um, Professor Warnick will like to invite him up to the podium to give closing remarks. Thank you. My closing remarks are really practical. I mean, I, I do want to say thank you all for sitting through this all day. I, you know, I, oh, school no. can be tough, and I, I hope you found this a valuable experience, and I hope you'll enjoy some refreshments afterwards. There are a couple practical points I want to make. First, I want to remind you again that if you have not submitted your biography and your photo, we have people that can help you do that today. Tomorrow's the last day. After that, don't complain. Um, uh, secondly, for those of you who are from uh, not-for-profit agencies and those of you who are not from not-for-profit agencies, for both of you, remember that uh, about half of the calls are calls where we're going to have referrals to an agency. And we do have a list of agencies in the back. Do not feel that you have to refer to CUNY. Uh, we do have our centers and we're very proud of them, but there's a lot of work out there and there are a lot of out outstanding organizations that are doing that work. If you are from an agency, do not hesitate. Well, we don't want you to take the name of the caller and we don't want you to give your name to the caller. Feel free to refer to your agency, however, and say you can get help at this agency. Here's the phone number. Um, and and uh, if, you're, if you're not from an agency, again, feel free to refer to any of the agencies that we have listed in the guide. If, it, it seems to be like confusing. You're not sure how to help the person. Have them call 311 because 311 will refer them to an agency that's near them. So I really appreciate all of you coming out today. It's really been a terrific day, and uh, I want to thank Matilde and uh, for her great work. <laughs> and I want to especially thank Tamara for putting together such a wonderful program. Let's party. All right. If you guys still have the eye clickers, can you please drop them off with me or Fatima, who's at the door? Thank you very much. Eye clickers, please. Good job.